Well, we'll start talking about simple methods. Here we've got a component unit which consists of a ball valve and a reversible turbine with reducer. The turbine is made of two leads with orifices, guide vanes and the very turbine. Blades and the impeller are set at an angle of 45 degrees that provides the highest efficiency. There is a balance beam which permits to change the level of containers and containers are connected with each other with a corrugated hose and a tube on which the ball valve and the turbine are set. Let's fill out on the containers with water. If the valve is opened and we have it opened, water will start filling in other containers through the hoses and the tube because the level of liquid in communicating vessels is the same. As soon as the containers are half full, we stop filling them. Now we have static situation. While we don't move containers, water is in a steady state condition and it doesn't flow to anywhere. When we change position of the balance beam to lower one container and to raise another one, water from the second container starts moving into the lowest container through the hoses and the tube because of loss of gravity that doesn't allow the levels of water in communicating vessels to be different. Of course, the flow of water starts pressing blades of the turbine and they, trying to release pressure, start moving and rotating the axle where these blades are set. On the reducer there is a gear that starts moving a bigger gear, which in turn will be moving a piston of our pump. In other words, water movement affects other parts of system. If we raise the left container a little bit higher, the water flow rate will increase, because the difference between levels of source of water and the place where it goes to will be bigger. That is exactly how water tower works. But let's speak again about our component unit. The difference between levels is bigger, so the water flow rate or the amount of water that flows through the turbine in a given period increases. Let's say that in one second 100 grams of water flowed through the turbine. Now it is 200. Grams. If you raise the left container higher, the water flow rate will increase more and it will be 400 grams of water flowing through the turbine in a second, making the turbine rotate faster. Now we will half close the valve. Of course now water meets with some resistance. Although the difference between levels of containers is the same, the water flow rate decreased. Much less water flows through the turbine now, and the efficiency decreased as well. If we close the valve at all, the stream of water will stop. Water will not be rotating the turbine, and the turbine will stop working. Why do I explain this? Very frequently electric current is compared to water. And mostly, that's correct. To prove it, we will use a laboratory kit. Here we have power supply, we will talk later about all its functions, and some components. To run the experiment, we take away all unnecessary things, and in the middle of the table we put special desk, which consists of insulation pad and columns with alligator clips. The columns are not connected, and they can move on the desk in slots. To run the first experiment, we clamp the alligator clip and the conductor. We connect power supply wires to the columns. The output voltage of power supply is zero, and after we switch it on, nothing happens. But when we turn the output voltage regulator, the current starts flowing through the conductor. In this case, the output voltage is 0.05 volts, and the current is of 5 amperes. Now let's talk more about all these numbers. The current is the amount of electrons that flows through the conductor in a given period of time. One ampere current means that 6,280 trillions of electrons has flown through the cross section of the conductor. Therefore, if the current is of 5 amperes, 31,000 400 quadrillion of electrons flow through the conductor in one second. The voltage is the charge size of each electron. I'd like to talk more about it, because people often confuse these matters. Not only conductors contain an electric charge, but also insulators. In physics it is called static electricity. I don't have a glass rod or an ebonite rod, but we can see static electricity when we rub a pen with fur. As you can see, a charge that appeared on the pen magnets fur. Experiments with a balloon rubbed with fur are much more impressive.
In physics, the unit of electric charge is named the coulomb. One coulomb is the size of charge. It means that in one second, 6,280 quadrillion of electrons, or one ampere, flows through the conductor. If the charge flows during work of one joule and liberating power of one watt, then the voltage that has been applied is of one volt. One coulomb charge is a very big number. In the case when two charged particles are one coulomb charged, their interaction force will be approximately the same as the force of the Earth, bringing towards one turn away thing. However, in the conductor existence of this kind of charge is possible. For example, a charge a little bit less than one coulomb flows through the 60 watt incandescent bulb in one second. That's why you should always be careful dealing with electricity and electric devices. All these numbers are named after their discoverers, who have run many experiments. The first person who connected all these units was Georg Ohm. Thanks to his law, we can make calculations. In electronics, coulombs are very, are very rarely used, but volts and amperes are the main units. For a better understanding, let's take a look again at our pump. The amount of flowing electrons resembles the amount of flowing through the turbine water, because in both cases we talk about quantitative value in a given period or in one second. The difference between levels of containers can be compared to the applied voltage. The voltage depends on the size of the charge, while the pressure of water depends on the gravity and atmospheric pressure. That's where we can see resemblance. The resistance of the conductor is permanent, the diameter of the tube is also fixed. When we change level of containers, the amount of water flowing through the tube increases. When we increase voltage, the amount of electrons flowing through the conductor also increases, so does the current. However, there are serious differences between current and water. Water always flows in one direction, while the direction of current flowing is an abstract question. In modern electronics, it is commonly believed that current flows from the positive side to the negative side. But current flowing means the flowing of electrons, and electrons flow from the negative electrode to the positive one. So in the reality, current flows from minus to plus. From plus to minus flows a charge named an electron hole. Electron hole. At first sight, there is no use in naming something that doesn't exist. The electron hole is a lack of an electron at a position where it could exist. There are many reasons of its lack. Anyway, thanks to the lack of the electron, the atom becomes very charged by the amount of electrons gained, because the amount of protons is bigger than the amount of electrons. The atom transfers into positive ion that has holes instead of electrons in its orbit. If positive ion exists, we can assume that negative one also exists. The negative ion exists because there are too much electrons in the orbit of the atom. In this case, the charge of all electrons becomes greater than the charge of all protons. Now let's make a conclusion. If we say that the current flows from, from plus to minus, it will not be incorrect, but only if we add that we speak about positive charge movement. If we say that the current flows from minus to plus, adding that we speak about electrons movement, it will also be true. There is another peculiarity about current. While electrons flow through the conductor, electromagnetic field appears around this conductor. If we speak about positive charge flowing through the conductor, then the direction of the magnetic field lines will be clockwise. It is called right-hand rule. How big the magnetic field is does not depend neither on the less length of the conductor, its diameter, nor on the color of its insulation. The electromagnetic field around the conductor depends on the current intensity. The stronger the current, the more intense the magnetic field. Not all the materials conduct electric current because of different resistance. The material is a conductor if its atoms lose and gain electrons easily. Otherwise, we call this material insulator, and such material cannot carry current. So, as an example, we can look at the valve of the pump. If it is opened, water will meet with almost no obstacles on its way. 
way. I say almost, because the diameter of this tube limits how much water will flow. If close the valve a little, it will become an obstacle, and the amount of water flowing in one second will be smaller. If we close the valve, water will stop flowing. The same happens with electric current. Any substance resists electrons flowing through it. This resistance depends on the form of the substance and its temperature. A capability of a material to oppose the flow of electric current is called electrical resistance. We can count electrical resistance on one meter long conductor with the area of cross section of one square millimeters. The unit of electrical resistance is the ohm. For example, the resistance of the one meter long copper conductor with a cross section of one square millimeters is from 0.17 to 0.18 ohm. The temperature during this process should be 20 degrees. If we warm up the substances, the resistance will be stronger. If we cool them, it will be weaker. At first glance, the resistance is not very strong, but if we talk about long conductors and much current, the resistance will mean a lot. A certain number of electrons can flow through the conductor, just like the water flows through the tube. Under high pressure, if we want more water flow through the tube, the tube will burst. The same will happen with the conductor, because of high temperature. The conductor will play part of resistance, and according to the Ohm's law, the heat rate of the conductor will depend on that resistance. As soon as the temperature of the conductor achieves metal melting point, the conductor break will happen. This effect is used in fuses. In other cases, the wrong choice of the cross section of the conductor results in ignition. That applies not only to wiring harness, but also to home appliances. Aside from the resistance, there is another requirement for insulators, a breakdown voltage. It is a characteristic of an insulator that defines the maximum voltage difference that can be applied across the material before the insulator collapses. In this case, you can see breakdown voltage of air with a voltage of 500 kV. So let's sum up and add some details. Electron is a negatively charged particle and the part of every atom. Atom has several orbits where electrons are rotating. The number of orbits cannot be higher than 7. The last orbit of atom defines some properties of atom in relation to the current. Also, it defines its possibility to connect with other atoms, making molecules and crystal lattices. If atom loses and gains electrons easily on the orbit, then the material which consists of such atoms is a conductor, because it almost doesn't resist current flowing. Otherwise, this material is an insulator. But these properties of atom don't affect the occurrence of the charge on the surface of the material. Static electricity can also appear on insulators. Only a certain number of electrons can flow through the material in a given period of time. Therefore, to increase channel capacity of the material, you should make cross-section larger, just like we make larger the diameter of the tube. Here you can see the current of 10 amperes flowing under the voltage of 0.1 volt. It means that according to Ohm's law, the resistance of the conductor between alligator clips is V divided by I. Why do we make a calculation for the conductor between the clips? Its cross-section is much smaller than cross-sections of conductors that are connected to the power supply. That's why we don't pay attention to the resistance of these wires. We can also calculate the power of the conductor using another version of the Ohm's law. For that we should multiply the applied voltage by the current. And we've got the result of 1 watt. When we know the resistance of the conductor, we can calculate its cross-section. Our conductor is copper, and the resistance of copper is 0 0.0175 Ohm. The length of the conductor is 25 centimeters. We know the resistance of 1 meter long conductor. Therefore, the resistance for 25 cm is 4 times less. But this resistance is for the copper conductor with a cross section of 1 square millimeters. We still have to calculate cross section of our conductor. The resistance of our conductor is 0.01 ohm. Now you will definitely decide to make a proportion and calculate the cross section. But that proportion will be wrong. So that's why, first of all, we convert 
convert resistance into conductivity. Or in other words, we should calculate conductance for the conductor with a cross section of 1 square millimeters, and only then conductance for our piece. Now let's make a proportion. So the area of our conductor is 0,44 square millimeters. Using this number, we can easily calculate its radius and the diameter, which is 0,74 millimeters. While the positive charge is flowing, the electron hole is moving. It means that some atoms get the electron from their neighbor, trying to become neutral again. A neutral atom is an atom in which there is the same amount of electrons and protons. In fact, electrons move, but in the opposite direction, which we call an electric current. While electrons flow through the conductor, electromagnetic field appears around with a clockwise direction of the magnetic field lines, if current stands for the movement of the positive charge. The strength of the field depends on the current flowing through the conductor, and it sums up with the strength of the magnetic field of the neighbor conductor, if its current flows in the same direction. But in our case, the field hasn't become bigger, instead two conductors appeared. Why? Of course two conductors appeared, but the current decreased two times. Only half of all current flows through every conductor. Their fields are half smaller now, and these fields, summing up, show us the very first size of the field. However, the strength of the magnetic field can be increased with the same current and using only one conductor. For that, we should make several coils of the conductor. Even without any corrections, we see that magnetic field is much brighter around inductance than around the conductor in the background. Pay attention to the fact that the strength of the magnetic field of the inductor depends on the number of coils and on the flowing current. The amount of work done by electricity depends on the applied power and on the flowing current, because as we found out, power is a voltage multiplied by current. But speaking about safety rules, you should remember the following. Human body contains 90% of water, and water, if not the best, but it is still a conductor. If the voltage is too high and its source can provide current of more than 100 mA, there is a possibility of fatal outcome. The current depends on the applied water voltage and resistance of a person who gets a shock. An average resistance of human body is 1000 ohms, and it can vary a lot. Therefore, it is supposed that dangerous alternative voltage is of 40 volts, and the direct voltage is of 60 volt. It is highly dangerous in rooms with high humidity or with many conductors, concrete walls and floor. The voltage of more than 12 volts is considered dangerous. But remember, the voltage strikes, but what kills is the current. That's why you can lose conscious because of the electric shock voltage of 40-50 kV, but in general it is safe. Also, the voltage of kinescopes that hustens electrodes is safe, although it can reach 27 kV. Sometimes this voltage only makes people bad-mouthing. But 90 volts of welding set can cause health problems and even be fatal. So I remind you one more time, try to work with currentless devices and if it is not possible, be really careful. The current doesn't care if you stay alive or not.